Hi students, I am Dr. Sakshi Arora Hans and today I am going to talk about the COVID-19 and its effect on pregnancy. Now this talk is not for general public. I am going to talk about the effect of COVID-19 on a pregnancy in terms of the questions which can be asked in your PG entrance exam. Two questions on COVID-19 you should expect in any of your exam, whether you are giving AIMS or you are giving PGI, JIPMER or uh, your uh, NEET exam or the MCI students who are going to appear for their foreign medical exams. I don't say that these two questions will be uh, from the effect of COVID-19 on pregnancy, but in general, two questions on COVID-19 you should expect and you should know all aspects of uh, COVID-19. So I'm going to tell you about how COVID-19 affects a pregnancy. So all of you know the general things about uh, the COVID-19 uh, disease. Right, so um, you all know that uh, the agent responsible for this COVID-19 pandemic is a novel coronavirus which has been called as COVID-19 because it's a coronavirus disease which was detected in 2019, specifically in December 2019. Earlier this was called as the SARS-CoV, that is the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. The incubation period for uh, COVID-19 is 2.2 to 11.5 days, median being 5.1 days. Mode of transmission, all of us know that majorly COVID-19 is spread by droplet infection, but yes, it can also spread by contact and by fomites and through fomites. It can affect any age group, right? But mostly uh, we see that it is affecting age group more than 30 years and it's less common in children less than 10 years. I don't think so. I need to tell you about the symptoms of COVID-19. All of you know that a COVID-19 patient uh, can present to you with cough or upper respiratory tract infection, fever, muscle pain, myalgias, headache, shortness of breath loss of smell and loss of taste and they can also present to you with GI symptoms like nausea, vomiting and diarrhea. Apart from this, what has to be remembered is that the patients, uh, there can be a patient who is positive, there can be a person rather I should say who is positive for COVID-19 but they are asymptomatic and this is what exactly happens in pregnancy. In pregnancy, most of the patients are asymptomatic, right? Apart from these general points, what you have to remember is that during the COVID-19 infection uh, in the patient, the cardiac injury markers may be raised, liver function uh, can be deranged and liver enzymes uh, may be raised and you may get lymphopenia, right? The investigation of choice for uh, COVID-19 is the RT-PCR, that is the real-time reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction since it is an RNA virus. Now, the, you know, the sample, how it is going to be collected, it is going to be collected from the nasopharynx and uh, you are going to this RT-PCR, it targets a number of genes in which the most specific gene which it targets is the RDRP gene, right? So this was in general about COVID-19. Now let's talk about how COVID-19 affects pregnancy. See, normally in a pregnant female, respiratory infections, they have increased mortality and morbidity and that is because of two reasons. Number one, in a pregnancy, there are physiological changes during pregnancy and because of the physiological changes in pregnancy, the lung capacity is decreased. And number two, because pregnancy is an immunocompromised state. So when we talk about respiratory infections, we see that in a pregnant female, any kind of respiratory infection will have increased mortality and increased morbidity. But the good point is that earlier reports showed that when COVID-19 pandemic they came, the earlier reports showed that pregnant females, they do not appear to be more susceptible to the consequences of infection of COVID-19 than general population. So the risk to a pregnant female is same as the risk to general population, right, in terms of acquiring the infection. 
so it's not this that a pregnant uh, female will be more susceptible to the infection but yes the recent reports have shown that if a pregnant female acquires an infection there are certain risks which are more in a pregnant female in comparison to a non pregnant female and what are those risks those risks are number 1 icu admission the risk of getting admitted to icu because of the severity of the disease number 2 the chances of being on mechanical ventilation again because of the severity of the disease and number 3 increased chances of anxiety and depression are seen in pregnant females so these are the three things which are seen more in a pregnant female in comparison to a non pregnant female who acquires covid 19 infection but again the good point is that the mortality rate is not increased right so although the severity of the disease will be more in a pregnant female in comparison to a non pregnant female but there is no increase in the rate of mortality right now the important features which you have to remember here are overall the risk to a pregnant female is still low in case of covid-19 as compared to risk from other upper respiratory tract infections right so in comparison to other upper respiratory tract illnesses the risk of acquiring covid-19 is less right and uh, you know when h1n1 epidemic it had come then at that time the pregnant females were more susceptible to h1n1 this is not the case with covid 19 right in pregnant females who have comorbidities for example if a pregnant female is obese or if she has diabetes or heart disease then yes she is at increased risk but then again that increased risk is consistent with a non pregnant female with similar comorbidities right so in general also we have seen that covid 19 the severity of covid 19 and the chances of acquiring covid 19 are more common in patients who have diabetes or obesity similarly pregnant females who are obese or diabetic or they have heart disease again they are at more risk but then the risk is consistent with non pregnant female with similar comorbidities clear then the third important point is that even if a pregnant female is infected more than equal to 90% have recovered without undergoing any delivery right so it was not needed in a pregnant female that since she is covid 19 i have to deliver the patient no more than 90% have recovered without undergoing any delivery last point which you have to remember here is that the racial factors also affect infection and why i'm saying that black and hispanic pregnant females they have increased chances of acquiring the infection in comparison to white females right so this was in general about the effect of covid-19 on pregnancy so in a pregnancy we are not only worried about the mother that how covid-19 affects the pregnant female which we saw just now that in a pregnant female the pregnant females they are not susceptible more they are not more susceptible to covid-19 but yes if infection occurs then there are increased chances of icu admission and mechanical uh, ventilation but overall the mortality rate is not increased now we are also worried about the fetus that how covid-19 is going to affect the fetus but before i tell you how covid-19 is going to affect the fetus at what time can covid-19 infect the fetus see number 1 a covid from a mother who is covid-19 positive the infection can go to the fetus during pregnancy and all of you know that that is called as vertical transmission that's the number one time when infection can happen number 2 during labor the infection can happen then that will be called as the intrapartum transmission and number 3 it can happen after delivery that is in the postpartum period 
the first thing what is important to know is that how am I going to know whether the infant which is born, the newborn, which is sorry, not infant, the newborn baby which is born with the infection which it is having, suppose it is tested to be COVID positive, whether that infection was acquired in the intrapartum period or it was acquired in the antenatal period or whether it was acquired in the postpartum period. How am I going to know that? So for that, you will have to understand that suppose if the mother is symptomatic, right? In a symptomatic mother, if I am getting a baby and a new neonate and I want to check and that neonate is affected by COVID-19 and I want to check whether the transmission happened during the antepartum period, that is whether vertical transmission was there or not. How am I going to know that? If you can confirm the presence of the virus in amniotic fluid prior to the rupture of membranes, that's one way in which you can say that yes, it's a case of vertical transmission. Number two, if virus can be confirmed in the cord blood of the neonate by PCR, or if the virus can be confirmed in the neonatal blood by uh, PCR within first 12 hours of birth, then you are going to say that yes, this infection occurred in the antepartum period and it's a case of vertical transmission. In asymptomatic mothers, you will come to know that vertical transmission had occurred if the virus can be confirmed in the cord blood by PCR or if the virus can be confirmed in the neonatal blood by PCR within first 12 hours of birth. That's very important. Within first 12 hours of birth, if you can confirm that yes, virus is present, whether it's present in the cord blood or whether it's present in the neonatal blood, you are going to say that it's a case of vertical transmission right now earlier in COVID-19 vertical transmission was not seen that was because very less pregnant females got affected and we had very less case studies to prove that vertical transmission has occurred but now what we have seen that yes the cases have been reported where vertical transmission has occurred but the good point is that this vertical transmission is not very frequent. It's an infrequent method, right? It's very less common in COVID-19. Although vertical transmission is happening, but it's less common, right? Then, now suppose mother is COVID positive and I get a neonate who's symptomatic at birth. How do I know that this infection was acquired during the process of delivery? Now, during the process of delivery, if the infection was acquired, then two things are going to be positive. If you check the nasopharyngeal swab of the neonate at birth, and that's one sample which you take. And the second sample, if you take after 24 to 48 hours of birth, both these samples will be positive. If both the samples are positive, then that means the infection was acquired during the process of delivery. In contrast, if the at birth the sample is negative, but 20, after 24 to 48 hours of birth, the sample is positive. Then that means that the infection was acquired in the postpartum period. So in intrapartum period, if the infection is acquired at birth, also the sample will be positive. And after 24 to 48 hours of birth, also the sample will be positive. But if the infection was acquired in the postpartum period, then the first sample which is taken at birth will be negative. But the second sample which is taken after 24 to 48 hours of birth will be positive. In the postpartum period, the infection, that, that's the most common time in which the infection spreads. Right, so COVID, a baby will acquire infection most commonly in the postpartum period. 
and how will what will be the most common mode of spread the most common mode of spread will be through droplet infection so it means that the mother or the caretaker was covid positive and through droplet infection the baby or the newborn baby acquired the infection right so if they ask you what is the most common time of spread of infection from mother to the child you are going to say the most common time of spread is the postpartum period and the most common route of spread is through droplet infection by the positive covid positive mother right now one very important thing which you should understand is that although uh the female may be covid positive and this covid virus may be seen in her nasopharyngeal swab still till now it is seen that covid 19 is absent in vaginal secretions in breast milk and in amniotic fluid so even if the mother is covid positive the covid 19 is not seen in the vaginal secretions breast milk and amniotic fluid till now it has not been detected right now one very important point which you should know is that why is vertical transmission less common in covid 19 there is a reason for that it's not by chance and the reason is that this covid 19 virus whenever it has to enter into a cell it needs two receptors number one is the ace receptor to the angiotensin converting enzyme receptor 2 and serine protease receptor 2 right so these are the two receptors which are needed by the covid 19 virus to enter into any cell and both these enzymes the angiotensin converting enzyme and the serine protease enzymes they are minimally expressed in the placenta and that is why their receptors are also less in placenta and that is why covid 19 affects placenta less and that is why the vertical transmission rate of covid 19 is less right so just now i was telling to you about at what time the fetus can be affected by this covid 19 infection now it's important to understand that how covid 19 infection can affect the fetus right see in covid 19 there is hyperthermia all of us know that right and this hyperthermia theoretically can lead to a problem if hyperthermia or if covid 19 is acquired in the first trimester it can lead to uh, problems in organogenesis and that can lead to increased risk of congenital anomalies especially neural tube defects also hyperthermia so number 1 hyperthermia can lead to congenital anomalies like neural tube defects number 2 it can lead to miscarriages right that is how hyperthermia can affect pregnancy and in covid 19 there is hyperthermia right but the good thing is that in covid 19 there is no data which suggest that there is increased risk of abortion or there is increased risk of teratogenicity so covid 19 infection does not lead to increased risk of abortion and it does not lead to teratogenicity till the what the current studies have shown mm -hmm. so currently covid 19 is not an indication for doing mtp right another very important point which you should note is that for treating the fever of um, uh, covid 19 we use acetaminophen that is the paracetamol now use of acetaminophen in the first trimester in a pregnant female is considered to be safe right rather it is beneficial because the mother will not have any adverse effect related to hyperthermia right so these were two very important points that covid 19 infection does not lead to an increased risk of abortion and it does not lead to increased teratogenicity but on the other hand there are data which suggest that there are four problems which can happen in the fetus because of covid 19 infection number 1 hyperthermia can lead to preterm labor and premature rupture of membrane that's number 1 problem number 2 it can lead to abnormal fetal heart rate patterns 
Number three, there is increased rate of cesarean deliveries in COVID-19 patients. And number four, suboptimal fetal growth because of placental insufficiency, which happens because of decreased utero-placental vascular perfusion, right? So these are four problems which can happen during pregnancy because of COVID-19. Number one is preterm labor. Number two, abnormal fetal heart rate patterns, which in turn will lead to cesarean section. And number four, suboptimal fetal growth, right? Now, when we are talking about a COVID-19 patient who is having preterm labor, what are the things which you have to keep in mind? Number one, what is the tocolytic of choice in a pregnant female with COVID-19? As usual, the tocolytic of choice is nifedipine because that's the best tocolytic and it does not have any problem in a COVID-19 patient also. With respect to beta mimetics, you should remember that beta mimetics, they are not used during pregnancy if the patient has COVID-19 because beta mimetics, they lead to increase in heart rate and they lead to increased chances of pulmonary edema. And as such, the respiratory functions are uh, low, the respiratory, there are a lot of resp cardio pulmonary problems during COVID-19, so we do not use beta mimetics. Now, if you remember in preterm labor, for neuroprotection of the fetus, we use magnesium sulfate normally, right? Now, in COVID-19 patients, use of magnesium sulfate is not much encouraged because magnesium sulfate leads to respiratory depression. So, each case will have to be individualized. Whether you should give magnesium sulfate or whether you shouldn't give, the risk and the benefit should be weighed properly. And so the use of magnesium sulfate in a COVID-19 pregnant female is plus minus. Each case will have to be individualized separately. Right? So this is how the COVID-19 affects the fetus. Now let's talk about the symptoms of COVID-19 in pregnancy. See, the symptoms of COVID-19 in pregnancy are same as a non-pregnant female or they are same as general population. That means the female will come to you. Most of the times, the pregnant females will be asymptomatic, right? If symptoms are present, symptoms will be the same. Like it can be a fever, the shortness of breath, cough, right? Myalgias, headache, nausea, vomiting and GI symptoms. And some of these symptoms, they overlap with the normal pregnancy changes also, right? So you will have to be very, very careful in a pregnant female whether these symptoms are happening due to pregnancy or whether they are happening due to COVID-19. Now, in general, there is a classification for classifying the patients of COVID-19 and the same classification is followed in pregnancy also. In non-pregnant females and in pregnant females, the classification of disease severity is the same. So, how do you classify a patient of COVID-19? You classify a patient of COVID-19 into five categories. Number one is an asymptomatic infection. Asymptomatic infection, as the name suggests, means that the patient doesn't have any symptoms, but the test came out to be positive. Then you have mild illness. Mild illness means that the patient is going to come to you with symptoms of fever, uh, they can be sore throat, cough, but lower respiratory tract infection symptoms like shortness of breath, dyspnea, they will be absent and chest imaging will be normal, right? So in mild uh, diseases, the lower respiratory tract infection symptoms are, pre are uh, absent and the chest imaging is normal. Then comes moderate. What is going to happen in moderate? In moderate, the lower respiratory tract infection symptoms like shortness of breath and dyspnea will be present. And on chest imaging also, you are going to get abnormal chest imaging. But the SpO2 in these patients will be more than 93%. So if SpO2 is more than 93% and you are getting shortness of breath and dyspnea or if you are getting abnormal chest x-ray or CT, that means it's a moderate illness. On the other hand, if SpO2 is coming less than 93% or respiratory rate is coming more than 30 or on, uh, you know, when you do a chest x-ray or you do a CT, you get lung infiltrates more than 50%, then you classify the disease as a severe disease. A critical disease means that there is respiratory failure, 
septic shock or multiple organ dysfunction. Now, this is how you classify a patient of COVID-19, right? Now, let's talk about the testing for COVID-19 in a pregnant female. So, first, let us talk about what are the indications in which you should go for a COVID testing in antenatal period. So, number one is when a patient, pregnant female comes to you, you have to take a detailed travel history. Now, when I say you have to take a detailed travel history, you know that as of now, the international travel is not happening, right? So, when you are taking a detailed travel history, you just don't have to take travel history of international travel. You have to take travel history for the domestic travel also because what I'm concerned is that when she would be traveling, she will be coming in contact with many people whose COVID status would not even be known to her, right? That is why you have to take a detailed travel history. Now, for example, your antenatal patient, she tells you that she had gone to Agra, right? From Delhi, she has gone to Agra. Then in that case, what is important? Next question is, okay, how did you go? Did you, did you go by your own car or did you take a public transport? So if she has taken, gone to Agra by her own car, obviously the risk of having COVID-19 by getting exposed to multiple people is less, right? On the other hand, if she is traveling to Agra on a public transport, the risk is increased. And in that case, definitely you will have to go for a COVID-19 testing, even if she is asymptomatic, right? So in asymptomatic patients, I'm going to go for a test if there is a travel history. Number two, in asymptomatic patients, asymptomatic pregnant patients, I am going to go for testing if she has been exposed to patients with symptoms of COVID-19. Number three, in asymptomatic patients, I am going to go for her testing if she's coming from hotspot areas, right? So the red zone, if she's coming from a red zone, then I am going to go for her uh, testing in antenatal period, even if she is asymptomatic. If the patient is immunocompromised, in that case, again, if she, is, she has diabetes or if she has heart disease, then also I am going to go for her COVID testing. Number six, which I have not mentioned here is, if, uh, an, if a healthcare provider is uh, your uh, pregnant, right? So if uh, a healthcare, if a doctor is pregnant, again, you should go for a COVID or a nurse or any healthcare worker is pregnant. In that case, you should go for COVID-19 testing. And last, obviously, if patient has symptoms of COVID-19, you have to go for COVID-19 testing. This is what you have to do in antenatal period when the test should be done. Now, as far as a, a pregnant female comes to you in labor, in that case, when I'll be talking about labor, I'll tell you that all and according to ICMR guidelines, all antenatal patients who are coming from uh, areas where COVID-19 is prevalent, you have to do their testing. Right. And so if a patient is coming to you from uh, India, basically in India, the ICMR guidelines are this is what they say that from the areas where COVID-19, the incidence of COVID-19 is very, very high from those areas. You have to go for the testing of a pregnant female if she comes in labor. Right. Irrespective of whether she has symptoms or not. Now. Why we are doing this is not only to prevent, uh, to protect from the healthcare professionals from acquiring infection, but also the other females who might be admitted in the labor room along with this patient, right? So it's very important that all females who go into labor and they are coming from those areas which are hotspot areas, you have to get their COVID-19 test done. But the other important point is that you are not going to delay the obstetrical management waiting for the report, right? Just because you are waiting for the report, you are not going to delay her obstetrical management. Clear? Then the most commonly done test for COVID-19 in a pregnant female like a non-pregnant female or like general population is the RT-PCR test, which itself is a nucleic acid amplification test. RT-PCR, I told you, it's reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction test. And it has a very high false negative rate. It is 30%. Now, suppose if, uh, and that's a very important question also. 
Now, suppose if you have a patient in whom you are suspecting she has symptoms of COVID-19, she has fever and cough and you send her RT-PCR but the test result comes out to be negative or it comes out to be inconclusive. In that case, you should repeat a second test but the second test should be done only after 24 hours and not before that. You can do it, you know, later than 24 hours, that's acceptable. But a repeat test within 24 hours of the previous test is not acceptable, right? Another very important point is that the specimen which you are taking, that is on that also the sensitivity depends. Normally, we take a nasopharyngeal swab or in some cases, they take a nasal swab. But with nasopharyngeal swab or with nasal swabs, the sensitivity is less as compared to a sample which is taken from lower respiratory tract. For example, sputum or bronchoalveolar lavage sample, right? So this can be a potential MCQ, but otherwise the sample which you are taking most commonly is a nasopharyngeal swab, right? Now, this is the test which is done most commonly, that is the RT-PCR test. Now, let's talk about chest x-rays and CT scans. Right now, if I want to know how severe the disease is, I will have to do, uh, you know, imaging, chest imaging, which can be done by a chest x-ray or it can be done by CT scan. Now, all of us are taught that chest x-rays are contraindicated during pregnancy, but in this situation where you have a patient with COVID-19, the test has come out to be positive. If you are doing a single chest x-ray, that is okay, that is acceptable because a single chest x-ray, it, ha it uh, you know, exposes the fetus to very less radiation dose. And the dose of radiation is 0.005 to 0.01 milligyrons, right? So, and we know that the maximum permissible exposure, radiation exposure to fetus is 5 gyrons. Whereas this one chest x-ray will give only 0.0005 to 0.01 exposure, right? So a single chest x-ray is acceptable. Similarly, a single CT, if indicated, Again, it's acceptable because the radiation exposure by a single CT is 0.01 to 0.66 rads, right? So, a single chest x-ray or single CT is acceptable. Just to be on the precautionary side, you can use an abdominal screen also, right? So, this was about the investigations which you have to do in a pregnant female in whom you are suspecting COVID-19. So now let's talk about how to prevent uh, this COVID-19 infection and the methods of prevention for COVID-19 in pregnant female and in general population are the same. I don't think so. You need any acronym to uh, remember this, uh, that how to prevent COVID-19, but still uh, you can use an acronym Wuhan to remember them, all of them, if you have to write some answer where you will advise the pregnant female that she should wash her hands, number one, then she should use her mask properly. Whenever she is going out, she has to use a mask and especially when she is going for antenatal visits, she has to use a surgical mask. She should get her temperature checked regularly. She should avoid large crowds. In other words, social distancing has to be maintained and she should never touch her face or eyes with unclean hands, right? So these are the general instructions which you give to any person, right? So, uh, so to the general population, also these instructions are given to prevent COVID-19 infection. Now, what is important in uh, pregnant females is that uh, in order to decrease her risk of getting exposed to COVID-19, you have to reduce her antenatal visits and these visits should be limited to the time at which they are very, very important, right? So at that time when you have to do some test, at that time you should limit the antenatal visits. Now, as per ICMR to all the pregnant females, they have to, at least you should tell them to come four times and uh, in the entire pregnancy during the COVID pandemic. And that is number one at 12 weeks, because at 12 weeks, when you are calling a pregnant female, not only will you do an antenatal checkup, but simultaneously you are going to do a genetic screening. In other words, you can simultaneously do aneuploidy screening, testing for Down's syndrome. 
then the second visit should be at 20 weeks because at 20 weeks you will do a morphological scan in other words you are going to do a level 2 ultrasound a detailed ultrasound to know about any or ma uh, congenital malformations right third visit should be scheduled at 28 weeks because at 28 weeks you will do a general checkup as well as you can test for gestational diabetes and you can give her tetanus injections as well and then the visit should be scheduled at 36 weeks at 36 weeks the advantage is that you can go for group b streptococci culture and simultaneously you can check what is the lie what is the presentation and if she is a primary gravida female you can also go for a pelvic examination so during COVID-19 pandemic, ICMR recommends four antenatal visits at 12 weeks, 20 weeks, 28 weeks and 36 weeks. Now, as per FIGO, there should be one more visit between 28 and 36 weeks and that is at 32 weeks, right? Now, as an obstetrician, during the COVID-19 pandemic, I should encourage patients that the number of routine growth scans should be reduced. So I should encourage my patients that I'm not going to do many growth scans during this period and I am going to curtail on the routine investigations also, right? This is only during COVID-19 pandemic, right? So these are the general precautions which have to be advised to all pregnant females during this COVID-19 pandemic. Now, how are you going to manage a pregnant female? who has been exposed to COVID-19 patient. Now, any pregnant female who has been exposed to COVID-19, suppose in her family, uh, someone comes out to be COVID positive, right? In that case, to, or in all such females, you remember when we were doing indications for testing, I told you if a pregnant female has been exposed to COVID-19, you have to do an RT-PCR. So whenever a pregnant female comes to you and she says that in my family someone has come out to be positive or I had met a friend a few days back and later I came to know that she is COVID-19 positive. In that case, you will have to go for RT-PCR and you are going to classify your patients in two categories, whether they are asymptomatic or whether they are symptomatic. In asymptomatic, you will tell them that they have to monitor at home right this is in the time by the time you know the covid uh, result comes out in the meanwhile they should be monitored at home and when they are being monitored at home they should be monitored for temperature and for respiratory symptoms now after 24 hours generally the covid-19 report comes and if suppose the report comes out to be negative then they should not worry and they should stop monitoring in case the report comes out to be positive and because your patient is asymptomatic you will tell them to be isolated at home for 14 days. Once that 14 days period is over, you have to do an ultrasound for fetal surveillance, right? And to see the growth of the fetus. So I am going to do a ultrasound or a growth scan once the 14 days is over. And I'm also going to do a Doppler. In all the patients who come out to be covid 19 positive i have after two weeks i have to do a growth scan and i have to do a doppler and this should be done then after every two weeks this should be repeated in covid 19 positive females right and you also have to advise the patients to keep a track of their fetal movements when the test comes out to be positive in general also they have to keep a track but especially if COVID-19 test has come out to be positive. This is how you manage a asymptomatic patient in whom RT-PCR test comes out to be positive. Remember that they have to be managed at home, right? Now, just in case your patient was symptomatic, the pregnant female got exposed to a COVID-19 patient and she herself has symptoms. She has fever or she has respiratory symptoms. Again, we have already sent the RT-PCR, but in symptomatic pregnant patients, you have to monitor them in your hospital till the time the report comes, right? Now, suppose the report comes and report comes out to be negative. In that case, you are going to send them back home and you are going to tell them that still they will have to remain isolated at home for 14 days. And if the symptoms persist, because we have very high false negative uh, cases, uh, 
false negative reports. So if the symptoms persist, they have to repeat the test after some time, right? And the test, as I told you, should not be repeated within 24 hours. It should always be repeated after 24 hours. That is if the test report comes out to be negative. Now suppose the test report comes out to be positive, then you are going to monitor them at hospital only. And when I say you are going to monitor them in hospital as or, you know, with respect to the mother, what is the monitoring I'm going to do? I'm going to monitor her temperature, her heart rate, her respiratory rate and her BP every three to four hours. Right, so total three to four times in a day, I have to monitor her temperature, heart rate, BP and respiratory rate. I am going to go for a chest x-ray and CT scan. And as I told you, that one single chest x-ray, one single CT scan in times of COVID, that's permissible, right? Now, as far as the fetus is concerned, I am going to give corticosteroid injection to the mother for fetal lung maturity in all pregnant females who are less than 34 weeks pregnant. So any COVID-19 patient with the symptoms, with a test positive, you have to give corticosteroids at less than 34 weeks. Between 34 to 37 weeks, you have to, you know, the cases have to be individualized. ACOG in general also says that between 34 to 37 weeks, we shouldn't give corticosteroids for preterm labor. But in COVID-19 cases also, but uh, you know, this recommendation of ACOG, it is not followed everywhere, even in non-COVID positive patients. So in COVID positive patients also, although ACOG gives the same recommendation that between 34 to 37 weeks, it's not necessary to give uh, corticosteroids to, uh, you know, for fetal lung maturity, but still you have to individualize each case. It depends upon the obstetrician. Most of the obstetricians in clinical practice between 34 to 37 weeks, they give corticosteroids, whether the patient is COVID positive or not if the patient has a risk of preterm labor. And in COVID-19, yes, one risk is there and that is a preterm labor risk is there. Now, when you are giving corticosteroid to a COVID-19 patient, it plays two roles. Number one role is, yes, it promotes fetal lung maturity. So recently it was seen that in general population, those who have severe disease, that means they needed supplemental oxygen or ventilatory support, dexamethasone was used in them and it showed good results, right? So similarly, if a pregnant female has severe disease and she's on supplemental oxygen or ventilatory support, then also dexamethasone can be used or the corticosteroids can be used. So in COVID-19 patients, corticosteroid has two roles. Number one is fetal lung maturity and number two is if there is a severe disease, right? And classification of severe disease, I have already told you right? Now, what are the indications in hospital that you have to shift the patient to ICU? Now, in order to shift the patient to ICU, you are going to do the SOFA score, that is the sequential organ failure assessment score. Now, if you are getting systolic BP less than 100, respiratory rate more than equal to 22, or if the mental status of the patient is altered, in these three conditions, you are going to shift the patient to ICU. That is, if systolic BP is less than 100, if her respiratory rate is more than equal to 22, or if the mental status of the patient is altered. So these are the indications for admitting a pregnant COVID-19 patient into ICU, right? So to just to sum it up, if you have an asymptomatic pregnant female but her test comes out to be positive, you are going to manage her at home. Symptomatic patients but test negative should also be managed at home. Symptomatic pregnant female with test positive should be managed in the hospital, right? Now, what are the drugs which you are going to use for uh, managing a pregnant female with COVID-19? Now, before See, the drugs are essentially the same. What you have to understand is in case of COVID-19 infection, there is increased risk of thromboembolic events, right? And all of us know that pregnancy itself is a hypercoagulable state. So 
in covid also the chances of thromboembolic events are high and pregnancy itself being a hypercoagulable state so it is recommended that all pregnant females who are covid positive they should be given heparin right so they have to be given prophylaxis against thromboembolism when they come to the hospital whether they come to the hospital for any covid related reason or whether they come to the hospital for any obstetrical complication any pregnant female who's covid positive you have to give her thromboprophylaxis uh, prophylaxis against thromboembolism right now the drug of choice in patients is unfractionated heparin in those patients in whom delivery is about to happen so if they are very close to their delivery then the drug of choice becomes unfractionated heparin and the dose is 5000 units subcutaneously every 12 hourly now you are going to say that ma'am why unfractionated heparin and why not low molecular weight heparin see unfractionated heparin it is preferred in pregnant women who are near to delivery because sorry just wait yeah because it is more readily reversed than low molecular weight heparin right low molecular weight heparin it should be given in women who are very remote from delivery just now or in postpartum females right so the drug of choice is heparin for a thromboprophylaxis but in females who in whom delivery is about to happen it is unfractionated heparin and in females in whom delivery is not imminent it's it's you know they are far from delivery in them it's low molecular weight heparin and post delivery also it is low molecular weight heparin now in a postpartum female as i told you the drug of choice will be low molecular weight heparin which you will have to give 4000 international units daily right till the patient is positive right so that is about heparin now what is the role of dexamethasone in a pregnant female as i told you to all covid 19 patients who are severely ill and they need oxygen support or ventilatory support dexamethasone is given and it has it has proved to be beneficial and the dose of dexamethasone which is given to general population is 6 mg daily for 10 days right or until discharge right so you have to give 6 mg daily for 10 days or you have to continue 6 mg daily till the patient is discharged now the same thing you have to do in a pregnant female also who is severely ill you will have to give her 6 mg daily for 10 days but now suppose there is a pregnant female who is severely ill and she has a risk of preterm labor also in that case what am i going to do in that case i am going to give her dexamethasone or betamethasone as usual the dose which you give for lung maturity like you give 6 mg 12 hourly uh, four injections of dexamethasone normally so in a covid 19 patient also you are going to give 6 mg 12 hourly four injections of dexamethasone or you can give 12 mg uh, two injections 24 hours apart of betamethasone right this is for the lung maturity now this should be followed by either prednisolone or hydrocortisone right so initially for lung maturity you give dexa and beta and then for the pregnant female who is severely ill and who needs either oxygen or ventilatory support for her benefit you will give her prednisolone or hydrocortisone why i am not continuing dexa in her is because you know uh, dexa can cross the placenta so unnecessary i will be exposing the fetus to dexa right so i have already given dexa for lung maturity and now if i continue giving dexa that is unnecessary exposing the fetus so give her dexa followed by prednisolone or hydrocortisone right now let's talk about the antivirals role in covid 19 in pregnancy see antiviral which is very promising is remdesivir now this remdesivir it's an adenosine analog and this was earlier tried in ebola virus and now it's being used for treating covid-19 infection it's given by iv infusion 
Now, till now, whatever data we have, remdesivir seems to be safe during pregnancy also. The adverse effect of remdesivir as such is it can lead to kidney injury and the dose of remdesivir which you have to remember is it is single IV dose 200 mg as a loading dose. So the loading dose is a single 200 mg IV dose followed by 100 mg daily IV infusion which should be given for 10 days. So the loading dose is 200 mg followed by 100 mg for 10 days. Right and remdesivir, yes, it's safe in pregnancy. The other antiviral combination which is being tried in uh, COVID-19 is ropinavir and ritonavir combination. This combination, it was used in HIV and now China used it against COVID-19. As far as their safety in pregnancy is concerned, Lopinavir, FDA doesn't categorize it into any of the categories for pregnancy, but ritonavir is a category B drug, right? And yes, they are possible therapeutic options in a pregnant female. So, lopinavir and ritonavir are also one of the options, antiviral options, which can be used in a pregnant female. As far as pneumonia is concerned, so if a pregnant female, she has secondary infections, secondary bacterial infections, then you are going to use the same drugs which you use in general public. For example, you can use azithromycin, you can use uh, amoxicillin and you can use uh, ceftriaxone. Now, a very important drug which WHO doesn't advise, but it is recommended by ICMR for treating COVID-19 in India is chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. Now, this is very, very important because in India we are using it, but WHO does not recommend it, right? Now, how does chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, that is HCQ, act? It acts by inhibiting the virus entry and both these drugs have immunomodulator properties and that is why they are also used in uh, SLE, right? The problem with uh, these drugs and especially more with HCQ is that it prolongs the QT interval and that is why it should be avoided with drugs which prolong QT interval. And one of the drugs which prolongs QT interval is azithromycin. So if you are using azithromycin for uh, the secondary bacterial infection and simultaneously you are using HCQ, you have to be very, very careful and you should get the ECG of the patient done because both these drugs can lead to QT prolongation. Then HCQ can also lead to hypoglycemia, neuropsychiatric symptoms, retinopathy and it can lead to hemolysis in G6PD deficiency, right? Now, HCQ can cross the placenta and animal studies have shown that it accumulates in the fetal ocular tissue. But this is not seen in humans. So, during pregnancy, you should use HCQ very carefully. But if you are using HCQ, then as of now, the studies have shown that it doesn't have any adverse effect. But still, you should use it with caution. The dose of HCQ which you have to give is on day one, you have to give 400 mg twice a day and then you have to use 200 mg daily for four days. So these are all the treatments which you can use in a pregnant female starting from heparin to dexamethasone to antivirals and then uh, antibiotics for secondary infection and chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, right? Now, let's talk about the time of delivery and the mode of uh, delivery in a COVID-19 uh, patient. So, one very important thing which I told you earlier also is that all pregnant females who are presenting to you in labor from areas where infection is widespread, you have to do their COVID testing done, right? So, that's one very important thing. Now, Time of delivery will not be changed based on the COVID-19 status, right? Time of delivery will not be changed. Only if your patient is severe or critically ill, in that case, and you are thinking to deliver the patient, then what you should keep in mind is that delivery should be done at more than equal to 32 to 34 weeks. You should try to take the pregnancy till 32 to 34 weeks and then deliver your patient right but as such time of delivery is 
not changed based on the COVID-19 status. You know, we wait for spontaneous labor pains or suppose patient has a PIH, then as it is indicated normally in PIH, we go by that, right? Just because patient has COVID-19, we are not going to change her timing of delivery, right? Similarly, her mode of delivery is not influenced by her COVID-19 status. Unless, until and unless her respiratory condition demands urgent delivery. You know, until and unless this is the case, till that time, her mode of delivery will not be changed and the best mode of delivery will remain vaginal delivery. Now, suppose during vaginal delivery in a COVID-19 patient, because in COVID-19, the respiratory capacity, the respiratory, uh, the uh, you know, the lungs are affected, the respiratory system is affected. So, if the patient becomes hypoxic or if she becomes exhausted during a vaginal delivery, in that case, you should cut short the second stage of labor using forceps or vacuum, right? Then, what are the general points which you have to remember during vaginal delivery is that the, your aim should be the oxygen saturation should be more than equal to 94%. Oxygen saturation should be measured every hourly. Every hour you have to measure the oxygen saturation of your patient. There is no contraindication to epidural analgesia. So if your patient wants painless delivery, you can go ahead and you can give her epidural analgesia, right? The indications for doing cesarean in case of COVID-19 patients are like the normal obstetrical indication. So if there is any obstetrical indication, like there is a contracted pelvis, then in that case, yes, you will have to go for a cesarean or if there is fetal distress, if there is acute organ failure or if there is septic shock. In these four conditions, cesarean is indicated in case of COVID-19 patients. So I'm repeating if there is any obstetrical indication, if there is fetal distress, if there is acute organ failure or in case of septic shock. Now, when you are uh, doing cesarean, what is the anesthesia which you are going to give? You are going to give either epidural or spinal anesthesia. General anesthesia is an aerosol generating procedure. So, the risk of spread of COVID-19 is more with general anesthesia. So, general anesthesia anyways has to be avoided. But suppose it becomes very necessary to give general anesthesia or to intubate the patient. In that case, the entire staff should be wearing full PPE kits including a filter face piece 3, FFP3. So they should be wearing entire, you know, the complete PPE kit should be worn by the entire staff if you are planning to give general anesthesia to the patient, right? Now, as far as the cord clamping is concerned, ACOG recommends delayed cord clamping. There are certain organizations which say that early cord clamping should be done because the risk of exposure of a fetus to COVID-19 or the newborn to COVID-19 is less with early cord clamping, but ACOG does not recommend that. So for us, whether it is ACOG, whether it is ICMR, both of them do not recommend early cord clamping. Both of them say that you have to go for delayed cord clamping in a COVID-19 patient, right? Now, suppose your COVID-19 patient needs induction of labor for any reason. In that case, just because she's COVID-19, you are not going to postpone the induction of labor. At the most, what you can do is cervical ripening can be done on outpatient basis using a balloon catheter. Right. So instead of calling her in your uh, hospital in the labor room for cervical ripening, you can do it in the outpatient basis using a balloon catheter. Suppose you have to do cervical ripening in the in uh, in the admitted patients. In that case, you know, just so that the time between the induction and delivery is less, and the less is the time, the less is the exposure to COVID nineteen. So in that case, you can expedite the procedure by doing two methods, combining two methods for induction of labor. For example, you can combine mechanical method, you can put a balloon catheter as well as you can give her mesoprost or you can do um, a balloon catheter and you can give her oxytocin. So this will decrease her time from induction to delivery and that is it will decrease her exposure to COVID-19. 
19 and it will not only decrease her exposure rather she is already affected it will decrease your exposure to uh, COVID-19 and the other people who are present in the delivery room their exposure to COVID-19 I'm sorry the patient is already COVID-19 so her exposure will not be decreased sorry right then you are going to go for continuous fetal heart rate monitoring during labor IV fluids should be restricted to less than 75 cc per hour as excessive fluids can lead to pulmonary edema. You are going to limit the number of per vaginal examinations. So, uh, when I started this topic, I told you that vaginal secretions and amniotic fluid, they do not show the presence of the virus. So, as of now, artificial rupture of membranes is not contraindicated in a COVID-19 patient clear so these are the things which you have to keep in mind when you are delivering a COVID-19 patient another very important point here is that labor has a very high risk of disseminating the virus and that is because number one in second stage of labor patient exhales forcefully right she, she pushes and when she pushes she exhales forcefully at that time there is a very high risk of the virus getting disseminated and number two, during pushing, she can also pass feces. And again, that has a very high risk of disseminating the virus. That is why entire staff should be wearing full PPE while delivering a COVID-19 patient. That's number one. Number two, you should restrict the birth attendant to only one per person. Right? So, these are the precautions which you have to take when you are delivering a COVID-19 pregnant female. Now, in the postpartum period, what you are going to do? How you are going to monitor the patient? In the postpartum period, a COVID-19 patient, you are going to monitor her based on her severity. If the patient is asymptomatic or if she is a suspected COVID-19 case, you are going to monitor her like you routinely monitor all your postpartum patients, right? Now, if the patient has mild illness, and I've already told you the classification of disease severity. So, if patient has mild illness, you have to check her vital signs. You have to monitor her input-output every four hours. So her vital signs, including her respiratory rate, her temperature, everything, pulse rate, PP should be monitored every four hours and her input output should be done every four hours for 24 hours after vaginal delivery and for 48 hours after cesarean section, right? This is if the illness is mild. In moderate cases, apart from all this, you have to do a continuous pulse oximetry monitoring for the first 24 hours. So in moderate cases, it has to be a continuous pulse oximetry monitoring for first 24 hours or till there is an improvement in the signs of the patient. Right, whichever happens later, till that time, you have to continuously monitor, do a pulse oximetry monitoring. If patient falls into a severe category or critical illness category, then you have to shift the patient to ICU after delivery and they will manage, right? So this is how you do maternal monitoring after labor. Now, how do you manage a COVID-19 patient if she has PPH? So most patients with COVID-19 who develop postpartum hemorrhage, they are managed according to the standard protocols. Like, so you know how to manage a non-COVID uh, positive patient, you know how to manage PPH in them, same things, same protocols you are going to apply in a COVID-19 patient also. But one very important thing which you have to remember is that some authors, they say that tranexamic acid, it should not be used in COVID-19 patients because tranexamic acid is has anti-fibrinolytic properties. And you know that in COVID-19, there is a risk for thrombosis and pregnancy itself is a hypercoagulable state so there are some authors who say that in COVID-19 patients who are severe or who have critical disease in them tranexamic acid should not be used to manage the PPH right similarly there are people who say that methyl ergometrin should not be used in COVID-19 patients 
who are severe or who are critically ill to manage PPH because methyl ergometrin has been associated with rare cases of respiratory failure and severe vasoconstriction. Right, so these are the two important things which you are going to keep in mind. Although no, neither ACOG nor ICMR have said that pranexamic acid or methyl ergometrin is contraindicated, we are going to keep these two things in mind because maybe in future, as more studies go on, these two drugs may become contraindicated. Right, so remember these two points now. How do you care for a newborn? right, who is born to a mother who is COVID-19 positive. Now, all the newborns who are born to COVID-19 mothers, they should be tested within first 24 hours of birth. That's one thing very important. And when you are testing such babies, you should take both the throat and the nasopharyngeal swabs as samples. Now, such babies, they should be isolated from other healthy newborns till the report comes, right? So, you should isolate these newborn babies from other healthy newborn babies. Now, till the time the period of viral shedding is not over, till that time, mother should be isolated from the newborn. So, if mother is COVID-19 positive, till the time the period of viral shedding is not over, you have to isolate mother and newborn you don't have to bring the newborn to the mother now if that is not possible if separate rooms for the newborn and for the mother are not possible in that case these three things should be done at least number one physical barriers like a curtain should be present between the mother and between the newborn mother should wear a face mask always and she should practice hand hygiene and distance between mother and newborn should be at least more than equal to six feet right so ideally the newborn and the mother should be in separate rooms they should be isolated from each other the newborn should be isolated from the mother but if that's not possible, then these three things should be taken care that there has to be a physical barrier between like a curtain between the mother and newborn. Mother should be wearing a mask all the time and she should practice hand hygiene and distance between mother and newborn should be more than equal to six feet. Now, till what time are you going to practice this? Till what time you're going to advise mother to do this? This should be done till at least three days have passed without symptoms. Right, And when I say three days have passed without symptoms, so if mother was having fever, at least mother shouldn't have fever for three days and this three days without fever should be without any medication. So not on medication she is afebrile, no. Without any medication she should be afebrile for three days till that and then after that the newborn can come to the mother, right? or at least 10 days have passed from the onset of the symptoms right till till 10 days you from the onset of symptoms till 10 days the mother and baby should be isolated or 10 days have passed since their first covid test report came positive so from the time mother's first covid test report came positive from that time 10 days should have passed after that only the baby can be shifted to the mother right now let's talk about a very important aspect and that is breastfeeding see since the beginning of uh, this video i have been telling you that till now the virus has not been detected in breast milk right so as such you know we will not advocate breastfeeding but breast milk is advocated. What we are going to tell the COVID-19 patient is that she should express her breast milk and that expressed breast milk should be given to the neonate, right? So breast milk is not contraindicated. Breast feeding is, yes, it's not advocated, right? Now, before expressing breast milk, a female should wear a mask. She should clean her hands and she should clean her breast with soap and water, right? So these are the precautions which she has to take before expressing breast milk. 
then comes very important point that uh, discharge should be planned early we do not want anyone to be unnecessarily exposed to covid 19 so after vaginal delivery after one day the patient should be discharged and after cesarean after two days she should be discharged right so these are all the important points which i wanted you to know about how covid 19 affects pregnancy and how you are going to manage a pregnant female with covid 19 I am repeating whatever I have told you is as per the knowledge we have today and you know more studies are coming so this knowledge will get more updated and whatever updates I have to tell you I'll inform you later on if there is any change in whatever I told you that I will inform you. In the meanwhile keep studying, keep safe and keep your spirits high. If you liked my video don't forget to press the like button and don't forget to share it with your friends and don't forget to press the bell icon so that you get notification about my future videos as well. Uh, you can find me on my uh, Facebook page that is Obs and Gaini by Dr. Sakshi Arora Hans and you can also uh, you know get our regular updates on my Instagram handle that is Dr. Sakshi Arora Hans. Thank you. Take care.